Hello, welcome to another Cosmology Talk. Today we have Helen Shao, who is an undergrad at Princeton, and Francisco Villescusa, who is a research scientist at the Simons Foundation. They're talking today about an application of machine learning to cosmology, and, and one that might even be teaching us some, uh, some physics. So specifically, they're using machine learning to measure the masses of subhalos, which are smaller halos of matter within larger halos, like galaxies and galaxy clusters. Uh, I like this work, especially because not only did it seem that the algorithm was finding something better than previous methods, but then they kind of stopped and tried to work out why it was working, not just saying stopping it, it works well, and try to find the mis missing physics explaining it. And it seemed to have something related to the virial theorem. So it's cool in that they were able to kind of spot some new application of a, of a physical principle rather than just having a better tool, uh, which I think is an amazing use of machine learning, teaching us new, new principles, not just new tools. So welcome, Helen and Paco. Do you want to tell us what you did that is described in the paper? Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, for this paper, we looked at several subhalo properties and using machine learning techniques, we have found a u and universal relation between the mass of subhalo and the other properties of subhalo and of the galaxy it hosts. If there were only two things people remember from the paper or this video six months from now, what would you want those two things to be? So thank you. Thank you, Sean, also for, for inviting us. So I think maybe one thing would be that the if you have data and this data live in a high dimensional space, it's actually not very difficult to look at the properties of this data and try to find if there are correlation, even hyper relations there. And maybe the other thing to remember is that we apparently has maybe found something that can be a universal uh, relation between uh, subhalo properties, which is something super cool. So why, why did you do this specific calculation? What was the background? Why was it interesting and important? Why did it happen in 2021 and not 2018? What were the tools that were, were needed for that? Why should we as the community be excited about, about this work? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so just as for some context, we know that halos, subhalos, and galaxies are characterized by many different properties, um, such as velocity dispersion, stellar mass, radius, etc. And we know that there are correlations among these variables, which indicates that the data may live in a lower dimensional manifold. So we wanted to search for these new hypersurfaces between the subhalo slash galaxy properties because such relations will help us understand the underlying physics responsible for structure formation as well as galaxy formation and evolution. So to give a brief overview of the background, like in the past, relations such as the tully fisher correlation and the fundamental plane have been found and their existence reflects the fundamental laws governing a particular process. We want to explore new relations like the ones concerning galaxies to further improve our understanding of these structures. Um, however, it is difficult to identify these relations in high dimensional spaces. And in our case, we are working with 12 variables, which is why uh, we believe two main uh, advances in the recent years are crucial to making such an attempt even possible. First being that there's been a big development in large hydrodynamic simulations of galaxies that provides us with a lot of data to use. And second, the growing field of machine learning and of course the advancements in neural networks are allowing us to explore these various properties and the huge amount of data we now have access to. Do you want to get into the detail of, of what the specific 12 parameters are and what the sub-manifold of parameters are and, and what are the parameters of, of interest, I guess, like masses of subhalos, but yeah, like how that's extracted. So yeah, in this project, we use machine learning techniques to find universal relations in subhalo properties. We also did this in collaboration with the authors listed here, and this is just the archive number for the paper. Subhalos and galaxies are characterized by many different properties, and I list here the ones that we use for this project, um, including the subhalo spin, stellar mass, and radius, etc. We know that most of these properties are not independent and that there are some correlations between them which are induced by their underlying physical mechanisms. Thus, finding these relations are very important for our understanding of these systems, but it is very difficult to do this in high dimensional spaces with so many properties. This is where using machine learning techniques come in because we can feed neural networks the uh, input subhalo data and it will find a way to map from these variables to a target variable. Uh, in our case, we are specifically trying to predict the total subhalo mass from the 11 other properties. For this paper, we use the CAMO simulations, which stands for the Cosmology and Astrophysics with Machine Learning Simulations. 
It is a large suite of 2,184 hydrodynamic simulations with 2,049 dark matter simulations. There are two simulation sets, the CAMELS Illustrious TNG and the CAMELS Simba. Each set contains different cosmological and astrophysical parameters. However, it is important to emphasize that the two simulations are run with different hydrodynamic codes, which we'll later see has a significant impact on the neural network's performance. I don't know if you'll go into this later on, but if, if not, uh, I think most people will be familiar with what Omega M and Sigma 8 are. Maybe other people will also be familiar with what ASN1, and I, I guess I can kind of maybe try and guess what those parameters mean, but do you want to just unpack what ASN1, ASN2, what's, what's the difference between one and two is what those parameters mean? Exactly. So, so, so this shown, uh, there are basically in this simulation, we've added two parameters that control supernova feedback that are this uh, SN1 and SN2. And then there are the other two that are basically control like agent feedback, the one and two. And one of them control, I think, like the, like the energy that is released. And the other one, for instance, controls like the, for instance, I think for AGN, like the velocity of the jets and, and this kind of property. Okay. And is it, is it true that kind of all interesting physics can actually be captured by two parameters each? That's a super good question. I think the answer is no, but this is actually a conversation that we are even having right now. In principle, what I would like to do is to vary all the parameters. You know, I think in, in, for at least in Lustig and Sima, we have around 30 parameters. The problem is that it's incredibly hard to explore a 30 dimension parameter space. We will need really, you know, maybe many more simulations that we can really afford. So that's why in Camels, we basically decide let's stick maybe to the parameters that we believe will have the largest effect for cosmological observables. So, so in that sense, you, you've also not used, say, Omega Baryon or the spectral index. You've just fixed them to be like some blank reference number or something. Exactly, exactly. But we're going to plan to vary this for NES, uh, for some Camels 2 um, simulations. So at some point, we were going to really explore the parameter space in its full glory, let's say. So this is a quick outline of our general methodology for finding relations in high dimensional spaces. We start by training and testing a neural network to learn a total subhalo mass. For training, we use the Camelos Illustrious TNG simulation, and we're looking at only subhalos at rest of zero with larger than 20 stellar particles. So in this diagram here, each input node would correspond to a subhalo property. Next, after training and testing, we would identify the variables that are most important for the neural network's predictions. So in, for instance, if we have these four properties that contribute more to the network's predictions. And we will use these variables to train a symbolic regression model that will give us an analytic expression that characterizes the neural network's relation. However, with symbolic regression, it's still developing technique and the found equations will not be as accurate as the neural network. Hence, we can try to improve the found model by, for instance, adjusting the equation with power laws guided by our knowledge of physics or introducing additional dependencies. Yeah, sorry, I'm not aware of the symbolic regression stuff. Is it, does it literally just some machine learning thing just invent a formula that looks as gibberish as, as this one? Or is it, what is the... This is a gibberish formula, but um, basically the idea is that it uses genetic programming to uh, create different combinations of operators and variables. And with different generations of these equations, it would uh, mutate and combine and would eventually try to find the best uh, equation that would fit to the data. Okay, okay. But, but not necessarily one that illuminates any physics. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that would be up to us. Just an, another slightly tangential question. So, so you said subhalo properties go in. Does the actual parent halos properties help in any way? Or, or are you just kind of meaning that's also part of the subhalo properties? Like the total mass of the parent halo? Or... That's a good question. So for, for this thing, Sean, we haven't considered any property of the parent subhalo. And as you will see, it seems that we, in principle, don't really need this. It, it works incredibly well. So it seems to be independent of where you live, your environment. So first, we trained a neural network on the subhalos from the Camelos Lister's TNG, which contained different astrophysics and cosmologies to learn the total mass of the subhalo. And once the neural network has been trained, we take subhalos that the network has never seen before, and we show the predictions of the total mass in this plot. 
So this figure is um, a 2D histogram, which um, each bin here indicates is colored to indicate the number of subhalos it contains. On the x-axis, we have the true value of the total mass, and on the y-axis, we have the predicted. And essentially, the closer these bins are to this y go to x line here, the tighter the relation and the more accurate the predictions. And we can see clearly that the model is doing very well with a rooming square error of only 2 times 10 to negative 2. And in, in the top left here, uh, I calculated that over 99% of the predictions lie within 0.2 dex of the true value. So if we take a look at the saliency values of the neural network's infra properties, we can see that the three most important variables uh, towards the neural network's predictions are the radius, velocity dispersion, and Vmax. Uh, just to clarify, we define the radius as the radius containing half of the subhalo's total mass. Velocity dispersion is calculated for all the particles in the system, and Vmax is just denotes the maximum circular velocity. Mm -hmm. So these aren't necessarily things that are easily measured observationally. Like the radius, by that definition, I can't even imagine how one would measure it. You're right. You're right, uh, Sean. Yep. And uh, so it may, it, it, what is a saliency value? I mean, I imagine what you've done is you've kind of like removed the radius from the algorithm and seen how, how bad the prediction gets. But is there like some mathematical de definition of saliency value? We, we don't actually have to remove any variables to calculate this. It's a commonly used machine learning technique. I think you do some computations involving the weights of the layers in the neural network, and there's a mathematical formula for it. Yeah, in this case, Sean, is, is basically, I mean, I remember, Helen, you, you use basically the, the gradient. This is like the, so, so in this case, it's basically, you know, you, you compute the gradient of your loss function, you know, how, how close you are, your, your prediction to the target. And basically, you compute the derivative of that quantity with respect to the input variable. So if the derivative is higher, typically means that a small change in that variable will change your output a lot. So you are very sensitive to that quantity. So that's, this quantity, basically, in this case, is telling you that. Yeah, I, I, I guess what I was hoping to get out of this is some sort of intuition for if, if a bar is twice as long, what does that mean compared So so... Like if, if I was to rescale the x-axis by x squared or by square root of x, I could change how how relatively long the radius is to the velocity dispersion. So like looking at this, it seems like I might give a rough, it's four times as important, but like, is that true? Like, or is it somehow, a, it, certainly it's more important radius to velocity dispersion, but. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky that question, Sean. I, I'm not sure if that's the correct interpretation. I will probably not assume that. And we will see later, you know, when, when Helen showed like the analytic formula that pretty much the, the first three variables probably matter at the same level. You know, when you see the formula, you see they are basically, you know, it's not that one weighs weight more than the others. It depends also on the unit that you are using and all these things, of course. So the neural net is achieving very high accuracy for the camel solicitors TNG subhalos. But what if we test it on a simulation with a different hydrodynamic solver? such as the CAMEL Simba simulations. So in this plot, we show how well the neural network performs when tested on D subhalos, and we can see that the scatter for the predicted total mass is significantly higher across all mass ranges than for the subhalos of the previous simulation, and the rooming square error is three times larger. However, we believe that this is due to the fact that the galaxies of the CAMEL Simba subhalos are generated with a code that solves the hydrodynamics equations in a very different way and it uses a distinct separate physics model, which causes the neural network to extrapolate poorly. However, we can still see that there is an overall main trend that is picked up by the model. We then wondered how well the neural network would perform if we tested on simulations of high resolution. So we carried out another test on the Elister's TNG 100 subhalos. And here we can see that at least for the higher mass ranges, the neural network is performing very well. Uh, with over 97% of the predictions falling within 0.2 dex of the true value. However, an interesting point here is that for the lower mass galaxies, for instance, subhalo is less than 10 to 9, the predictions exhibit a very large scatter. And this is probably due to the fact that in this simulation, Elistris TNG 100, there are subhalos that are much smaller than the ones seen during training of the neural network. So when we train the neural network with camels, 
the masses did not get to that regime. As a result, the neural network is unable to extrapolate properly to that mass range. Um, another test that we wanted to see is how well the neural network would perform if we tested on a simulation of much larger volume. So this is for the Illustrious TNG 300 subhalos. And again, we can see that the model is able to achieve very high accuracy with room mean square error of only 2.06 times, times 10 to negative 2. However, in the highest masses, for the highest masses subhalos, we can see that there is a bias here. And similar to the last situation, in this simulation, it is because, uh, because of its larger volume, it contains subhalos with much higher masses than, with, than what was seen during training. And again, as a result, the neural network cannot extrapolate to that regime. But nevertheless, the model overall is very accurate and appears to be using a robust relation between the subhalo properties to predict the total mass. We then performed a few more tests to verify the robustness of the model. For example, we tested a neural net on subhalos from redshifts higher than the one used at training, which was at redshift zero. And what we found is that for all simulations, the model is able to extrapolate very well, and the Rumi square error is similar to that at redshift zero. We also wanted to see if the model accuracy would vary if we tested it on central subhalos versus satellites. Surprisingly, we found that the neural network is able to perform very similarly for both types of systems. And other tests that we did include testing the model on n-body simulations, which contain dark matter only subhalos, uh, training the neural network on other simulations, and then testing on the rest, and also training the neural network with fewer properties, which I'll uh, show the plot for this later. So when you say testing on n-body simulations, there's, I guess, fewer parameters available there? So you just use the subset of the parameters? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, we only use the parameters available in those simulations. But um, in general, all of these tests, tests indicate that the relation found by a neural network may be a universal one, as it holds when being used on simulations with different cosmologies, subgrid models, volumes, and even different redshifts. Sorry, can I ask a stupid question? When you say testing, you mean you re-ran the neural network, right? Like. So, so, so you, you created a new neural network that was then able to predict at the higher redshift? No, we are using the, the neural network that was trained already on the original. The, the idea shown is that we train only on Illustris TNG, only one model at one redshift, and then it works for everything else, <laughs> which is very surprising because, you know, I know that usually neural networks don't extrapolate very well. Yeah, because of this, we were very interested in finding an analytic expression for the total mass to see what was the underlying physics behind the relation. And we started this by training a symbolic regression model on the CAMELS illustrious CNG simulations. And one of the equations that the model found was the simple power law relating the subhalo total mass to its radius and sigma, which is the velocity dispersion. So here, a, alpha, and beta are free parameters that the model fits to. And if we test this equation on all four simulations, we can see clearly that it definitely does not work as well compared to the neural network with high scatters in the low mass end and a significant bias towards the larger masses. Is it important to sort of unpack what the algorithm is? What, what does PYSR mean here? Oh, yes, this is... Pister, yes, this is the algorithm that, that we use, the package that we use to run the symbolic regression model. And do you give it all of the parameters you're interested in or just those three that were the most important ones and then and then it, it restricts itself to power laws or or what is it what is its space of mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. We first tried running it with all eleven properties, like we did with the original neural network, but the equations that we're getting were very complex and they were not able to extrapolate well. So Using the CLNC values, we limited down to just these three properties. And it's not limited to power loss, but we felt that you know, there are some operators that we can eliminate. And uh, the power law is one of the best equations that I've found. Yeah, but um, this equation does not, very, does not work very well. So we tried a different approach. Instead of training with symbolic regression, we tried just using linear regression to fit a relation of this form here. It's slightly more complex, 
And uh, first, you can see that we are including a running index in the uh, powers because we found that the exponents uh, has some implicit dependence on the parameters. And we also decided to include Vmax in addition to radius and sigma because we found that Vmax is especially important for predicting the subhalo total mass in the low mass end. And finally, we fit this equation to three different mass ranges to hopefully like optimize the accuracy. So in the first mass range, it would be for subhalos with masses less than 10 to 10, and an intermediate regime from 10 to 10 to 10 to 12, and finally the massive, the most massive regime from for masses greater than 10 to 12. And these were the equations that we obtained. So again, we test these equations on the four simulations, starting with the Camels Illustrious TNG. So this is for the Camels Illustrious TNG simulations. And immediately you can see that with these analytic expressions, there is no huge scatter that we saw before or a huge bias or any bias in the high mass end. And if we compare this with the predictions from a neural network that was trained on the same three variables, radius, sigma, and Vmax, we can see now that in this case, the analytic equations are much more comparable to the accuracy of the neural network compared with the symbolic regression model that we found earlier. And then I include a third plot here just to show you how well the accuracy uh, of the predictions would improve if uh, the neural network has information from all 11 properties. And even though the um, analytic equations are performing better, we can still see that neural network has an overall higher um, accuracy. And this probably means that the analytic, analytic equations that we found are just an approximation of the neural network's relation. Uh, we repeat this analysis for the camel Simba simulations. And in this case, um, even with the neural network, we can see that there is some bias towards the highest, uh, most massive subhalos but there is none in our analytic expressions. And uh, it's interesting to note that for our equations, the range with the highest error is actually in the intermediate regime, which is um, increasing the re rooming square error uh, by a lot. Next, for the illustrious CNG100 simulations, one of the biggest results is that <laughs> in the lower mass ends, this huge scatter that was seen in both neural networks is now fixed with our analytic equations. And the rooming square error is also very low. Yeah, and similarly for the illustrious TNG300 simulations, um, as I mentioned earlier, it, the neural networks are unable to extrapolate well to this mass regime. Whereas for the analytic equations, we don't have a bias that we saw with neural networks. Um, so yeah, just a few summary, just a summary of a few key points that we have discussed. First, uh, we found that neural networks are able to find a universal relation between the total mass of the subhalo and its other subhalo properties. Uh, we have used symbolic regression to find a simple power law that describes the main trend of the total mass, but it exhibits significant biases in both the high and low mass ends. So we attempted to adjust the equation uh, by most importantly including Vmax, which we find is crucial for the low mass end predictions. And we were able to find a robust analytic ex expression that extrapolates better than the neural network in some cases in the low and high mass ends. However, we saw that the neural network achieves overall a higher accuracy than the analytic expressions. And this indicates two things, one being that the analytic model is just an approximation of what the neural network found, and two uh, being that there's the neural network is um, getting some other information from the other properties that we are not using in our expressions. Uh, finally, I just want to discuss a little about the physical interpretation of the um, equations and the models that we have found. So we believe that this model, it may be a universal relation uh, because as long as the system is virialized, the relation would hold. So it is connected fundamentally to the virial theorem.
So in this case, it wouldn't matter what the feedback processes are or what the redshift resolution or cosmological parameters are. In such a system, the kinetic energy is going to be proportional to the potential energy. And this is the gravity-driven physics that we have unveiled behind the relation we found. However, um, the equations that we found, we believe may not be the may not equal to the variable relation uh, for several reasons, one being that our definitions of the variables are very different from the definitions of the variables used in the variable theorem. So for instance, we define the radius to contain half of the total mass, while the variable theorem uses the radius at the, um, viral, of the variable system. Moreover, we found that the network um, and the analytic expressions make use of Vmax, the maximum circular velocity, which does not appear in the variable theorem. And we also know that other variables, such as gas metallicity and star formation rate, may be contributing to the accuracy of the neural network. In general, while the equations we found are complex, they are able to capture the main trend of the relation found between the mass and the other subhalo properties. And they may help us in understanding the underlying physics behind subhalo and galaxy formation and evolution that is ultimately responsible for shaping the distribution of dark matter, gas, and stars in the universe. You, you with your uh, AR alpha sigma beta model, you only you only fitted it to the whole space, but then with your other analytic expression, you broke it up into bins. I can guess what the answer to the, my question is, but if you had broken that expression up into three bins, does it still not do too well? Yeah, we tried doing that, and we found that for the lower masses, with just radius and sigma, um, the expression would not be able to perform with high accuracy. That's why we introduced Vmax to the uh, equations. Am I am I just like committing numerology here to see that like the alpha was always quite close to to one? It, it was not close to one in the middle bin, which actually uh, was the least well fitting bin, if that makes sense. Like. It's suspiciously close to one. Is there some physical reason one expects why it should be one? I think Helen can show. So this is actually it is close to two. Oh, sorry, to to one. <laughs> well, and yeah, and I noticed on this one that alpha, like the sigma property, was close to two, which was interesting. But then it wasn't close to two in the other um, in the other model. So I gave up on it. But yeah. Yeah, I think this is precisely shown the reason why we believe this is related to the Villar theorem because you know if in this particular expression alpha will be 2 and beta will be 1, basically that's kind of the Virial theorem. So in our case, what we find is that you cannot really have this index to be fixed. It somehow it has a little bit of a slope, and that's why we introduce this thing by hand. And then when you introduce this, I think you are shuffling things, so then the interpretation might not be so clear. I guess it's no, there's nothing demanding that the corrections to this expression, if it was alpha equals 2 and beta equals 1, that, that they would follow a power law, so it if you force those corrections into a power law framework, you, you you could then, in your best fit, move away from alpha equals two and beta equals one because the the, the corrections aren't of the right form, perhaps. Um, so I guess then it just requires yeah imagination to if it indeed it is a virial theorem responsible or virial theorem machine physics requires imagination to work out what the what the deviations look like. But we also, as, as Helen said before, I mean, we also know that other variables are a little bit important, not as much as this one, you know, like the, like the star formation rate. So, so there might be something else beyond the Virial theorem. Probably the Virial theorem is the main thing here, but still, you know, there might be something else. And I don't know, it's, to me, it's really interesting, right? I mean, like, what exactly is, is this? <laughs> Sorry, just a quick sort of specific technical question. When, when you were fitting this symbolic regression, were you only using the training data or were you using the whole population? Oh, no, we reserved like a training data set for the training of the symbolic regression. And then when we tested it uh, for these plots, it was on a set that the model has never seen before. But, but even for the symbolic regression, not, not just yes. for the neural network. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. What work being done in cosmology at the moment do you think is particularly underappreciated by the community as a whole? Yeah, so um, for me, well, I've entered like the cosmology research community recently, but um, I think that machine learning is definitely going to have a huge impact on the way we um, perform research in cosmology. And 
um, going into the future, I think investing more time in collecting and running simulations and developing machine learning algorithms that will allow us to predict and extract the maximum amount of information from the data that we have. Yeah, and, and, and from, from my side, uh, Sean, very similar. So, I mean, as you know, I have been working in kind of like traditional cosmology for, for many years, you know, doing like the standard approach. And, you know, recently, like a few years ago, I, I, I discovered like, you know, machine learning, in particular deep learning and these things. And I seriously believe that this is a revolution. I mean, this is going to completely change things. Um, and this is not only for cosmology. I think this is also something much more general, you know, biology, chemistry, as we have seen, you know, from alpha fall and this kind of thing. This is really a revolution. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a, a new tool that uh, is very accessible, you know, I mean, I mean, Helen is a second year undergraduate uh, student, right? I mean, she's extremely good, but, you know, <laughs> she's an undergraduate. And she has done this amazing work in two months, basically. So it's a tool that is very accessible uh, to people. There is, I mean, if you look online, there is so many resources uh, to learn about this. And um, uh, on top of this, it's, in, it's usually worse. Probably the, the, the most important problem here sometimes is the interpretation in most of the cases, I will say, usually we see this as a black box. You, we don't really know. Even in this case where we have tried to derive equation, we're still not sure what exactly is what we have found. So in that sense, there is a lot of room for, for, for improve on this. But, you know, we are in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the era of big data. And, you know, with these kind of tools, is I really believe that this is going to be what is going to revolutionize uh, cosmology. So I'm not sure if this is underappreciated, Sean, because as you know, uh, this is a field that is exploding. There is a lot of people working on this thing right now. Uh, but there are some subfields, maybe in, 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 in this uh, machine learning that still not many people are aware, like for instance, graph, neural networks, maybe not many people are using them, or this kind of symbolic regression stuff. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it's totally valid to think that even the most appreciated thing is underappreciated if it's still not appreciated enough. The fear with machine learning, but but that's that, that this isn't an argument against using it at all. It's just what one might want to use it for is that is the whole black box aspect that you you you're worried on one sense that it might not extrapolate to the the thing that you actually care about. If, for example, if you're testing it on simulations, it might not work on real observations. I mean, that, that's true of the simulations rather than the machine learning network, though, in that case. And then also, even if, even if it does work perfectly and it's, it, it, you know, we, can, we can fit parameters to models brilliantly and, and there's no mistake going on, if we haven't learned what the physics is that it's matching, then I guess, have we done what we actually wanted to do as, as scientists? But, but that doesn't mean that it, it can be an amazing tool. Like, like I guess you're trying to do here. You're saying, look, we've found this better algorithm. It's a bit of a black box, but let's let's now try and work out exactly what it has done. I always think of the kind of chess analogy that you've got, like Alpha Zero, which can play chess better than anyone. But you, that that people don't just like just give up and go, okay, well, there's no point playing chess anymore. They they see what Alpha Zero does and go, like, why on earth did it move that pawn? Like, it doesn't make any sense. But obviously, it's better than us, so it, it must make sense somehow. And then, then you finally work out: ah, okay, this is a whole sort of possible tactic in this situation that we we weren't aware of. So I guess here it's it's the same thing. It might teach us not new fundamental physics. I mean, not at this level. Maybe maybe, maybe it could eventually. But uh, yeah, some new way of combining the physics we're already aware of. So you know, we run the simulation, but we don't know what. I mean, it's exactly what you guys were saying in your intro. You don't know, you've got a 16 parameter space. You don't know which set of them and which combination is the interesting set. And, and this can tell you. Exactly. There are many, many, many applications. Like for instance, Sean, some of them are more kind of, maybe you don't require, a, I don't know, maybe a lot of interpretation. Like for instance, machine learning can be used to speed up simulations. You know, we need simulations to, you know, make our theory predictions when we want to, you know, when we have DESI or Euclid, we will need to extract information there. So. We typically use simulation for this. Simulation are very expensive, right? But maybe we can train a neural net to speed up these things because at the end of the day, the simulation are just running the same, basically, equation over and over and over again, right? So you can find maybe the mapping so you don't have to do this every time. And, you know, maybe in that case, I don't know, it would be nice to, to understand, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah, and if you've, if you've run it at, like, omega matter equals 0.1, at 0.11, at 0.12, at 0.13, 
and you see that it's doing a very well, good prediction, then I guess you can trust your neural network to tell you what it is at 0 0.105 and 0.125 and, and like in the in between the values uh, that, that, that I guess you can trust. In the field, as in like actually being used for observations, the, the thing that looks quite promising is for photometric redshifts. There seem to be like a lot of groups that are that are doing that, that they're saying, okay, we've we've actually measured in the real world spectroscopic redshifts of this subset of galaxies. So we know their redshifts pretty accurately. And then photometrically, we've also looked at them, okay, we don't need the photometric redshifts because we've got the spectroscopic redshifts, but we can train our neural net on this training data, which is actual real data. Now we can get photometric data with the same instrument on other galaxies, and we don't have to pay for spe spectroscopy and we know the redshifts. Um, that seems like something that as a, as a sort of theoretical cosmologist, I'm not too bothered with the fundamental understanding of photometric redshifts. I guess there are other people who, who really would care and be like, no, I don't care. It's a black box. But as a tool, knowing photometric redshifts more accurately is presumably um, very useful for cosmology as a whole. Exactly. Exactly. And, and there are a lot of examples of that kind. And I think, Sean, sometimes, you know, you train the network, you don't maybe understand what it's doing, but then you can interrogate, you know, what happened if I now give this input without removing this variable. Maybe things get very worse. So, you know, you can try to interrogate the network. And by doing this, you actually are going to learn something. And, and is that any different to a professor with a graduate student? The, the work the graduate student or the undergraduate is, is still a, a black box, right? Like they just say, graduate student, go do this work. Graduate student comes back with a plot. Ah, okay. Well, why don't you try changing this parameter? Graduate student goes away, comes back with a different plot. So... It's just a different machine doing a different type of learning, perhaps. Exactly, exactly. I mean, as, as you know very well, I mean, sometimes in science, we don't really know what is the correct path uh, and, every, and anything, right? It's like you, you, you try, sometimes it works, sometimes it fails. But in this case, usually you have this tool that is going to give you more or less like a very good, you know, a very good direction. So you might not know exactly what it's doing, but it's pointing you in the good direction. So that's why, to me, it's very, very nice. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe, click the bell if you want to be notified of more videos and click like to help with YouTube algorithms. And don't forget to share the channel with, with colleagues. If you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment. I'll make sure that Paco and Helen see the, the questions. And thanks Helen and Paco for the great talk. Yeah, thank you again for inviting us. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you very much.